talk about some more uh, motions that the defense had put forward yesterday. One asking for the trial to be delayed and two for a change of venue. And as of just now, Judge Cahill said that both of those things are still in play. Um, both of those are still up for consideration. So we'll be seeing about that tomorrow. Um, every morning between 8 and 9 o'clock, some of this housekeeping work, these motions are taken care of. And that same exact thing happened this morning. We heard some motions actually related to evidence that the defense is trying to bring into this trial, evidence that Judge Cahill has denied several times now, but the defense uh, keeps trying to be re-entered. So a lot happened. To break some of that down for us, we are welcoming Mike Bryant from Bradshaw and Bryant, a, a local law firm here. Hey, Mike, thanks for being with us. Yes. Hi, how are you doing today? Well, well thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Much. So I want to, um, oh, I'm sorry. I have to mute myself here so we don't have an echo. So thank you so much for being with us. Like I said, a lot happened here in court this morning, so we would love your help breaking it down. We know that this is at least the second time that defense attorney Eric Nelson has asked for information about this May 2019 incident with George Floyd. Uh, to be admitted into the court. This happened a year before his death, a year before this incident that we're in court for right now. Uh, talk about the, the argument that Eric Nelson is building here. Why does he want this incident included? Well, they, there was a couple of things in the argument this morning that were of interest. One is the discussion he had with Judge Cahill about what, what importance what George Floyd knew would have. Um, they are attempting to bring in, they got apparently some statements from the FBI um, and they're arguing that they're getting in some information that maybe the paramedics told George Floyd that he was susceptible to a heart attack or uh, a stroke if he ingested drugs in this manner. And the, the, the two things came up is one, when you start arguing about prejudice, which the prosecution went into, the prejudice is is towards the state, not towards George Floyd. So you can't argue that prejudicing him, at, since he's not actually the party, is actually prejudice. But alternatively, they can't argue that um, that somehow he had knowledge, and because he had that knowledge, that somehow he was at fault. The judge went back to police officers show up, they treat people the way they do, and they get them as they as they do. The, the, the thing that struck me about the case and the case law they brought up is normally we're not dealing with a defendant that's allowed to kill the victim in some circumstances because there are circumstances police officers are able to kill people. So it's different than your average defendant where the only issue is did you kill him or not kill him? Here it's like, did you rightfully kill him or wrongfully kill him? That's what the case is about. So there's 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 an oddness about a lot of cases. I think the prosecution made a point at one point during their argument of saying, you know, I'm arguing something normally is argued on the other side. And that that's what's happening in this trial is there's issues that normally you don't deal with when you're the prosecution. You know, you're not into the giant fight of it was justified to kill this guy in most circumstances. And alternatively, as a defense, when they because this this goes back to the issue of finding the drugs in the car. And that's another thing they want to get in because they want to create this belief that he took drugs the last time and then he took drugs this time and that's really what killed him or that seems to be part of their defense. So, so when they do that, they're arguing this, what would normally be shoddy police work, which is a common defense. You know, the police did a bad job of investigating. But here, this is the police. They didn't get arrested at the scene. They were the original police. So the question comes up is, how did you miss these drugs that supposedly were in the back of the car until so much later? And then we got into the discussion today about the BCA and how many times they went in. And the judge says he wasn't worried too much about the delay issue. But, you know, Nelson found it was, or uh, the prosecution found it was important to spend some time talking about the reasons why it was the time of night and those type of things. So there's there's all sorts of weird things on top of everything else going on in this trial. Well, that's the impression that I even got this morning. It was that conversation about the allowing that 2019 incident to be included really kind of created a domino effect of talking um, about a lot of things, like you mentioned, the search of that car, uh, the BCA. And a couple of times, Judge Cahill this morning even said, like, okay, we need to get, get back on topic. Um, 
this really went into the weeds, but I'm, I'm curious from you, you know, back in September, Judge Cahill said that he wasn't going to allow this. Last week, he said he wasn't going to allow this. And then today, he kind of left it a little bit more open, I felt like, to consideration. What do you think changed? Well, I think he wanted to think about a couple of the other things. And then also it's been pointed out, they're getting statements from the FBI that didn't exist before. So I think there constantly has to be the, the extra stuff that keeps showing up in this trial makes for, you know, normally you're pretty close to all the evidence at this point. They keep finding new stuff or getting new stuff. And I think what the judge was doing is we need to look at that statement in, in, in what's called in camera, which means he reviews it. So it's not out in public. He, he uh, looks at it and says whether it's admissible. And that's what got it rolling along. Just him saying, no, based upon everything I know, I'm going to continue to keep that out. And I know you're not a lawyer in this case, but I didn't catch it this morning. Did you wear this document? He said it was about a thousand pages that he got, you know, as early as last Monday. Uh, that came from the FBI. Where does this come from? How did the lawyers get this and why are they just now getting it? Well, we heard the other day that the FBI, I think about a week or two weeks ago, we heard the FBI is looking at other civil rights violations by Chauvin or by the police officers. So they're continuing to investigate and they're continuing to take statements. So it's coming out of those statements that are being created when agents go and talk to these individuals and come up with more information that's out there. And, you know, I think, uh, I think it was the defense that kind of is like, well, I'm in trial and I'm busy, which is why I didn't, you know, just jump on this immediately. Um, and so they're getting new information. And that's, that's the, that's the strangeness about this trial It's all the new stuff that keeps coming out. Well, I wanted to ask you that how, how common is it that there's simultaneously another similar or at least some crossover investigation happening uh, literally while this trial is trying to get off the ground. How rare is that? I, I don't I don't think there is a comparison. Um, I don't know. Um, I'd have to spend some time thinking about, but very rarely. I mean, normally in circumstances, and I, I think we'll get a little bit further into this. Normally, when there's a civil case or the criminal case, the civil case is put on hold until the criminal case is done. So you have this you have this circumstance where you know you had issues in the civil case. Normally, you don't have. Normally, the feds have gotten together with the 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 the, the local people and made decisions about what's going to happen as far as charges go. So you don't have all these extra things in the air and all these extra questions out there now. You don't have the delay in trial. You know, if you didn't have COVID, you wouldn't. And, you know, you did a great job earlier uh, today during one of the breaks talking about the way the courtroom set up because of COVID. Just the idea of the timeline on this. This case would have been tried a long time ago if it wasn't for COVID. And so there's all those factors that, that took place. You also, to go back to, to, to that issue, is you would have had a grand jury at the very beginning of this that would have said, these are the charges based upon the evidence, and you'd have charges that you never were able to do because of COVID in this case. So what I gather from, from you and our previous conversations, really everything about this case has been rather unprecedented. Absolutely. There's this, this case is going to go down as, well, it's going to go down as uh, a great example of how, how good this system works to do all the things that we've done differently and been able to still keep things going. But alternatively, the judge, everything's been done to make sure they don't create uh, an appealable issue by shortcutting or doing it. You know, you could have tried to do some things. You know, I, I go back to the example that people, why couldn't you have done a grand jury by Zoom? It's because you didn't want this case to be the test case from if that works. So, so you know, they, they've done a really good job of making sure they don't cut corners in, in, in giving, they're giving the, the defendants the rights they get under the constitution. Uh, you mentioned the, the delay that this case would have likely happened or that the trial would have come up uh, quicker if it wasn't for COVID. In this case, we've seen defense file motions to delay the trial. We've seen the prosecution yeah. file motions to delay trial. There was the question of delaying trial last week because of the Court of Appeals decision. Now, just in the last 10 minutes, we heard Judge Cahill literally say that that motion for continuance is still up for consideration. Do you foresee a situation where that's granted, where this is delayed? 
It, I think it'll depend on how the jurors ask, answer the question tomorrow. They're going to bring in these jurors. You know, he's given it, sounds like an hour and a half, and it's going to be very limited to the questions. But if every one of them comes in and says, yeah, I heard about the settlement, and now it's affected me differently from what I gave you for answers next week, I think the judge has got to look at that and say, okay, we're starting from ground one, and when do we start from ground one? I can absolutely guarantee you the prosecution did not expect a week ago to be arguing for no continuance. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, 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 they ever thought if, if someone asked for another reason for continuance, I got to believe they were thinking, let's continue this thing. Because they would love to put the trial back together. They would love to get to the vaccine so that we can run a different trial. So there's lots of reasons why they wanted to continue it to begin with. But I today they were forced to get in a position to say no continuance because it's only based upon actions that, that as they point out, they didn't have control over. Mm -hmm. You know, this was something done by the city and done. The judge, when he said, yes, this cuts and it can cut either way, the problem is it cuts into the trial. It's another thing this trial didn't need right now that was added to it for whatever reason. Because I can give you an argument that it hurt the defense. I can give you the argument it hurt the prosecution. It hurt It hurt the trial. And we shouldn't be doing that right now. Yeah, we heard yesterday. I know exactly what exchange you're referencing. The prosecutor says, I don't know which way this cuts for us or against us. And the judge says that it doesn't matter. The fact is that it does cut. Um, yes. So yes, that was interesting. Okay, you mentioned that you foresee this motion on continuance, this motion to delay the trial, really relying on what those seven jurors say when they come back tomorrow. How common, I know everything is unprecedented with this trial, but how common is it to call back half of your jury that's been selected to ask them if they've heard more information about a case? The only way it would happen is something come up that wasn't because because normally if somebody said, hey, I want to ask these questions, the judge would say, well, why didn't you ask the questions before? So the only way it would come up is something changed so much that they had to bring them back. So you'll have certain circumstances where, uh, you know, like I'll, I'll, a couple of examples I've seen someone on the jury has an epileptic seizure. OK, suddenly out of the blue, boom, they have a seizure. The judge will bring the jurors back and say, hey, how's everybody doing? You know, is everybody OK with continuing? Is everybody OK with with going along these lines? That's one example. I think if I remember right, during the tobacco trial, some things happened where they brought the jury back and they asked the jury, you know, based upon what's happened, what whatever it was. And I, I but it seems to me there were a couple things. They checked in with the jury to see how everybody was. They checked in those kind of things. Other than that, the idea of bringing back jurors, you know, when you got this many picked to bring them back and to re-ask them questions, that that would only happen if there's something new. And we got something new. Not only bring them back, they're bringing them back over Zoom. And, you know, you talked right. about there wasn't a grand jury in this case because it would have been done over Zoom. They didn't really want this case to be the guinea pig. Um, are, have there been other cases in the age of COVID where things with jurors are done over Zoom at all? Or is this pretty new? Other jurisdictions have used Zoom. Um, there's been a couple trials conducted with Zoom that are just bench trials, which means just with the judge without a jury. Um, I, I think they're probably, they're at this point looking at it saying, look, it's only going to be a couple of questions because you have a process. You have the judge ask questions, then you have the defense ask questions, and you have the prosecutor ask questions. And the reason the prosecutor goes last because they have the burden of proof. So like in a civil case, which we we do a lot of, we, we would go before uh, the burden of proofs on us. So we go last as far as the, the, the jury, the void year goes. Um, so what they're going to do is bring him back. I don't know if the judge is going to ask him some questions, um, but for sure he's going to give each attorney a chance to ask questions and you'll have trials sometimes where suddenly something will come up about a particular juror, you know, like the juror will send a note through the bailiff that says, Hey, I just realized I know this witness that came on the stand and they'll bring them in individually in the courtroom and ask them some questions or they'll do that back in chambers. So it's the equivalent of doing this back in chambers. And you're saying, I don't want them to have to come all the way downtown to answer a couple questions because the reality is you hopefully you're going to have all of them say, no, sorry, didn't hear it. I don't know. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, 
kind of they're supposed to be ignoring anything about this trial so if they're following that then thank hopefully that'll be the answer but if they're all come back and say oh yeah i heard that and that's really affected me i think if if he's got to start at ground zero again with jurors then we're gonna have a problem yeah well and kate we've heard judge cahill talking about this a lot i mean in this day and age all of us know it can be challenging to not see that stuff whether it's like a notification on your phone or you're scrolling through something or there was even a juror who said you know the tv's on in the break room at work so i see these things okay so what happens if we come back and say it's just one juror has heard something can you just remove that one juror and okay yeah. so now we have eight instead of nine yep yep then we go back to uh you know we've lost one and you know we still got you know the 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 the, the numbers still depend upon how comfortable the judge thinks right now that they're going to get a jury so if you're sitting with nine then you know we only need we only need five more okay and so since you only need five more you can look at it and say well we have a potential of a hundred or whatever number they have coming in they know the judge feels more comfortable than he did back when he needed you know 14 jurors and he, he's like until i know how comfortable until you watch judges through a void year process get a little bit more looser about who they let go the more they think they got uh, they got potential people to replace it. But as soon as they start thinking, oh my God, we need to keep it tight, then you need to worry about those questions. That's why it was interesting that the pro that the defense asked for more strikes because of this issue. So, so one of the ways the judge may decide to do this is if tomorrow, say he brings nine back and he doesn't get rid of all of them, but he gets rid of three of them, he might decide... I gave you those three because of this, depending on how they cut. If the three of them say the reason why I, I, I saw it and I think it affects me is because I believe this proves he's guilty, then that's basically three strikes for the defense. If it comes back and, and the three people say the reason why I think this affects me is this is proof the city's doubtful about the case and trying to get it done, okay? or. I decided this was really all about money and, and this whole criminal thing is a joke. Then those are really prosecution strikes. So so he may look at those and decide, I kind of gave you the extra strikes by doing what I just did. So so that'll be, that's why I think it, there's two things that, that are, there's a promising thing and then there's the question mark is what will those people say when they come back? That's important. Then the, the promising thing is anytime a judge sets it up to say, Oh, we're going to bring people in at 9 30. that's a sign he plans to keep going <laughs> you know when they're scheduling if, if, if it was we're going to bring these people back and then we're going to have a motion then we're going to decide what we're going to do and we may not bring jurors back until the afternoon then you start sweating because the judge may be deciding i'm not going to continue to go ahead i believe kate judge cahill's doing everything he possibly can to get this thing done get it done right but get it done and that's where i think he'll go you you um mentioned about judges getting looser once they feel like okay so we're pretty sure that we're going to be able to get 14 people lined up uh he nine out of the last 13 potential jurors have been dismissed by judge cahill um is this a normal amount i just felt like watching last week he wasn't as quick to dismiss um do you think that it, it he's changed his tune do you think the way that the trial goes impacts how willing or quick he is to dismiss jurors yeah um i mean it depends on questions you know suddenly you know it's it, it, sometimes you know some certain questions you suddenly start thinking oh now i understand why they're asking that question and it has that impact and so so they i you know judges are human and they make the decision they do but yeah the the more you get closer to the end the looser they are at, at allowing people to be struck interesting so i did have a few people ask me you know that that settlement it, it's clear that that is having an impact um, on the case, whether it's coming in those forms of motion or we're calling these jurors back, or like I said, that first juror on the stand yesterday, that was the first thing that she said is, I heard about that settlement, it changed my mind. Yep. Um, my question for you, that's, it was such a big left turn. A couple of people asked me, well, why didn't Eric Nelson just call for a mistrial on Monday? Why didn't he just say, there's no way we can move forward? Oh, because the question, yeah, you can't prove it cuts one way or the other for sure. 
I mean, until you start asking jurors, you know, if it was during trial it happened and you already started taking evidence and that happened, then I, I think for sure you'd get that kind of motion. While you're picking jurors, since you still have a whole pool out there, it's hard to say it's a mistrial at this point. And you don't know how it cuts because the, there's an argument that it's proof that, that, well, this is really about the money. They don't, they don't really care. And as callous as that sounds, you'll get people that'll take that position that it's, that's not about a crime or, or trying to hold somebody liable. It's only about this. And so there, who knows, um, you know, what impact it has on people. Excellent. Thank you. My last kind of question here for you. Um, as far as we know right now, again, this could change tomorrow when we call these seven jurors back. If one of them has a conflict and gets dismissed, uh, but we have these five spots left. What is the defense and the prosecution? What are their strategies going to be in filling these last five spots? Well, you start by this point, you can start identifying who you think your leaders will be on the jury. So if you start, it, you get to a point sometimes where there's certain people that you let on the, that, you, that you don't worry about on the jury because it's like, that's just going to be a follower. They're going to follow. Now, you never know because you're only, you're still limited on the amount of time you're asking questions. But your guess is that that'll probably be a follower. And if it's a follower, they're not as significant in the whole process. Now, the, the, the defense is trying to identify one or two people that if they can't win this trial, meaning it's found him found not guilty, they at least can get a hung jury. So they're into the very end looking for that person that they will be independent and stand by themselves. So they may have a they'll have a different look at it than say the the prosecution was. But you're 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 starting to look at your your jury will be a community that'll come together in a certain way. And you're starting to build that community um, by what you have for numbers already with the caveat that you may lose a couple of those people tomorrow. They may go into it tomorrow thinking, you know, I want to, I want to still try to get rid of four and six or, you know, whatever the number is. So there might be certain people in that group. They think better off if we get rid of those people, or there might be some people they think, boy, I really want that person. So, please don't come in and say something that hurts us, you know, and you, you'll see a, you'll see some sort of, of, um, of uh, it, the, the, the sort of rehabilitation through, through certain questions, you know, that's where the judge goes back to, or uh, the, the, the prosecution goes back to, but even though you said the sky was purple that day, are you willing to listen to law and accept that it could be blue that day? And then they say, yes, even though they just made the statement about the sky being purple, that makes you, your blood go cold. So, you know, the, so it's, you, you're developing who that community is. And at the same time, you're still wondering who else is coming in. Hmm, that's really interesting. So they might be seeing this as a second chance to knock that juror off that they weren't too crazy about. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because if that person was close on the fence before, they knew a lot at that point, you know. Um, and, and, and that's where at times I've been a little bit uncomfortable with the amount of information we're getting on each of these people because we're really getting a lot of information but it's public if someone went into a courtroom they'd be able to hear these things but you know there there are certain things and so if you know someone you know tweeted or you know somebody read a lot of news about this that'd be the kind of person that if you think i want to get rid of them you might design some questions that are particularly to them you know I can imagine tomorrow, though, the line of questioning that the lawyers will be able to put back at these jurors. There'll be some some rules to keep it narrow related to that settlement. Right. I mean, we're not starting that like ground zero. Yeah, they won't. They won't allow them to. They, they, it should be. It, it will be completely confined to, you know, uh, the area of the settlement. But sometimes you find out how creative people can be and how they're able to link stuff together. And here's why I need to ask this question. You know, I mean, what what will be interesting is how much does the judge question to begin with? You know, I mean, if the judge opens up with the question on each person that says, are you aware that there was a settlement and they say no, you know, it may be why you ask me any more questions. So mm -hmm. that that that's what we'll see a little bit tomorrow also. 
Interesting. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mike Bryant from the law firm Bradshaw and Brian. We thank you so much for being here with us and walking us through some of this complexity and uh, certainly will be a lot to watch tomorrow morning. Yeah, it's this is vital information. I mean, people that are that, that tune into this and watch this our system. This is how it works. Uh, I've been impressed on what we've seen so far and uh, what we've done for the defendants under the Constitution. And this is great stuff. Awesome. Great. Mike, thank you so much for joining us.